The ability to protect the Great Lakes depends on both the natural processes that dictate the flow of water into the lakes and the way our populations use our water resources. At this time, the eight states and two Canadian provinces that border the lakes are working to protect these waters through the Great Lakes Compact Agreement. When you're looking at the current legislation that's under debate, for example, the, the compact language, I mean, that's really an attempt to do holistic ecosystem management, to look at this environment, this system as a system, instead of looking at it as a, as a bunch of little different pieces of a pie. How can one manage the waters of an ecosystem as big as the Great Lakes? Together, they're the largest source of liquid fresh water on the Earth's surface. The, uh, the streams in the watershed throughout the Great Lakes region are, uh, are really the, the arteries uh, of the Great Lakes system. They feed fresh water and new water into the Great Lakes uh, every time it rains and snows and as gravity pulls it downhill. Well, the uh, primary influx to the lake is uh, by rain, of course, direct precipitation, and by uh, streams delivering precipitation that landed in the basin, but not on the lake itself. Within the Great Lakes states, there's a natural drainage basin. We know where the subcontinental divide is, the boundaries of the Great Lakes Basin, which separate it from the other major watersheds. Water's either going one way or it's going the other. And where we are here in Milwaukee, that water drains to Lake Michigan. Some people outside the basin rely on lakes and rivers. And this surface water is what most people think of when we talk about water sources. But many people depend solely on groundwater. 20% of the world's fresh surface water is in the Great Lakes, but 95% of the world's fresh water is in groundwater. Uh, so we have to get people to understand that they have other sources of water than, than the Great Lakes. In Wisconsin alone, there is 1.2 quadrillion gallons of groundwater, nearly as much as in Lake Michigan. The groundwater basin is determined by where the groundwater enters at the land surface, trickles down to the water table, and then it moves through the rock and through the sand um, to typically to surface water bodies, lakes, streams, even Lake Michigan, but also to wells. Uh, the first and most noticeable thing is that the water levels tend to go down. And so if you over pump an aquifer uh, to a large extent, then they, the water table gets lower right around your well and it extends outwards in a sort of a cone shape. And so a large cone of depression such as we see here in southeast Wisconsin is something like 700 feet deep and extends throughout the whole region. The groundwater table has been declining over the past 50 to 100 years. Um, mostly as the region's population has grown and there's been a, more of a demand for water supply. The groundwater can't support as big a population density as, as Lake Michigan can, so <clears throat> communities to the west of the divide are, are clamoring to bring water from the lake. The latest example is Waukesha, Wisconsin, where the county straddles the divide, one part in the Lake Michigan Basin and one part draining to the Mississippi. There's a lot of interest in the Great Lakes because of pressures on, on a lack of water. This is an agreement that the eight Great Lakes governors got together, and our governor, Jim Doyle, was the, one of the leaders in this issue, to try to come up with a way to, to manage this system as a system. This is our best and maybe last chance in building strong protections for our Great Lakes going forward into the future. We're all drinking out of the same tap, essentially. We need to put in, uh, you know, a legal framework in which we can deal with those issues. You know, we got to have an answer to this. You can't just say, no, you can't have it. That's not an answer. 